Other expenditures um, added over the course of the year, we now spend over a trillion dollars on our military. In 2010, it increased. The recent defense authorization bill that denied the DREAM Act, by the way, that was that excluded the DREAM Act out of it, uh, totals uh, $663 billion of new spending, and plus with additional supplemental spending will be $1.03 trillion. So we see that there's an increasing attempt to, to allocate funds towards international uh, military expansion at a time when there's the pushing down of the standard of living here at home with budget cuts, education cuts, cuts in social spending, cuts in social services. To pay for this pro project, the standard of living has to be lowered in this country. The other effort to increase U.S. economic or co corporate economic power internationally has been through debt-induced restructuring. And this is what brings in the, transfer, the transference of people from Mexico. Because NAFTA was passed, not at the point of a gun, at the point of a pin. A pin that said, if, if you want your ec economy to not go bankrupt and your country to collapse, then we will loan you money, the International Monetary Fund, we will loan you money, uh, but you must make changes that open up your economy to free trade. So these two techniques have been used to increase profitability internationally. Um, and in the case of Mexico, that helps us understand why so many people have lost out. But within this country, migrant and immigrant workers have also played a role. Initially, the idea was to create new pools of cheap labor. As the U.S. economy restructured itself, outsourcing jobs overseas, and developing a larger service, low-wage service sector internally. Immigrant workers were going to be the new source of wealth because they could be paid less wages. And as non-citizens, they can be leveraged against unions because part of the process of lowering the standard of living in this country has been to, to move into a post-union economy. And in fact, we've seen the rate of unionization declining dramatically in this country over the last three years. Migrant workers also became a convenient scapegoat when the economy itself went into contraction. So the same year of the passage of NAFTA, the same year as the building of the border wall, was also uh, the year of a substantial economic recession. And we've seen a correlation between the intensification of immigration enforcement with economic crisis in the United States. And this has everything to do with politics, which is to say, when we have economic crisis and increasing inequality, in fact, we have the largest rate of inequality on the books right now, ever since they've been keeping uh, track of inequality in the United States. They just, uh, uh, this information was recently released. But during times of economic crisis, immigrants become a political scapegoat, which is to say, they're here taking our jobs. They're here living off of our welfare system. And this, is repeated ad nauseum to the point where, unless there's something to counter that, then people begin to believe it. So this helps us understand why there's been an increasing uh, level of an enforcement at the same time in which migrant workers are a source of tremendous profits for our economy. Part of this has to do with keeping labor costs low which is to say immigration enforcement is not designed, and I, will, I'm, I argue this, it's not designed to expel or eliminate an immigrant workforce. It's designed to maintain a segregated workforce. A workforce that does not have the opportunity to get access to legalization because that's not the intention of the system. So enforcement is strategic and selective. And what I mean by that is the way it's carried out is, even in the words of policymakers, it's not designed to mass deport. It's designed to make life increasingly difficult for people to integrate, which is why enforcement has been concentrated at points of integration in the workforce, in communities, 
in public spaces. There's another reason why this intensif the intensification of enforcement is selective, and it's because immigrant workers and migrant communities themselves did not play according to the rules and withdraw into the shadows and maintain their passivity, but rather began to organize. Like other previous epochs of US history when immigrants were targeted by nativists and by the, the financial elites in this country, they began to organize. May 1st, 2006, was an expression of this organization. But this was a defensive measure against one of the first comprehensive attempts to deny full integration uh, for immigrants and criminalization. In fact, immigrants and migrant peoples have been doing something for a longer period of time that has gotten more attention, which is they're organizing unions, and they're joining unions, and they're forming organizations that are designed to counter the segregation that they experience in their daily lives. Immigrants are 12, now 12% 12 of the unionized workforce, the fastest growing sector of any sector in the, in the labor movement. They're 5% of the national workforce. But if you go to places like Los Angeles, where there's a lot, hard, uh, larger concentrations of, of migrant workers, you could see up to 50 or 60% in, in some areas. But they're also poised to be the fastest uh, growing sector of the future workforce. And so, in part, segregation is a strategy to ensure that the divides are maintained into the future. And we see that anti-labor policies in this country have been passed through the funnel point of racism. And we see that anti-Latino racism has been passed through the funnel point of, of immigration enforcement. And I point that out because in places like Arizona, one of the largest, one of the fastest growing sectors, one of the most vibrant and dynamic sectors of the population is the Latino population, most of whom are citizens. But this process of demographic change, this process of people standing up and, and, and calling for full integration and equal rights is something that potentially disrupts the current configuration of profit making. So it's important then to understand why we haven't had an immigration reform. Because it's important to understand that in our when in April of 2010, when President Obama said, we're not going to pass an immigration reform this year. And he said, Congress just doesn't have the appetite for it. That, those are his words. I would say that we have to look beyond the individual, and we have to look beyond both political parties, and say, what is really the driving force of politics in this country? And right now, it is not the people. And right now, it is not... The, 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 the political actors in the political parties. Although they're the engineers, uh, they're the, the people who carry out the policies, but my point is, is that neither political party at this point in time sees in the interest of the national economy uh, a legalization program. So when Obama declared that legalization is not on the agenda, despite the fact that we have full majorities of Democrats, you know, up until the next election probably, full majority of Democrats, then it raises the question, what is the most important factor that's determining this issue? 